Cats podcast. Ready? Let's go. Welcome to the Community Cats podcast. I am your host, Stacey LeBaron. I've been involved helping homeless cats for over 20 years with the Merrimack River Feline Rescue Society. The goal of this podcast is to expose you to amazing people who are improving the lives of cats. I hope these interviews will help you learn how you can turn your passion for cats into action. And today's show is a part two with a great conversation that I had with Carmen DiCenzo and Mike Kiley. Carmen is with Dakin Humane Society and Mike is with the MSPCA, both in Massachusetts. Many of you might recognize Mike Kiley's name as he was a very early episode of ours, way, way back. He's episode number nine. So if you go to the Community Cats Podcast homepage at communitycatspodcast.com and go to the search bar, and just put in Mike or number nine, you will get that first episode and find out all about Mike, everything you wanted to know about him and more. But today we are talking with Carmen and Mike together in part two of this great conversation that we had all about cats. And so I hope you enjoy this second episode and thanks again for tuning in. I just want to shift a little bit and ask you guys, I get this question a lot from folks, you know, they're, they're working for an organization or they're working in a community. They're trying to help community cats, but they feel like they're just hitting the brick wall all the time, or they're trying to create change. They're trying to advocate for change. Both of you have worked with different organizations and certainly have advocated for quite a bit of change over the, the last several years. So, you know, what tips would you give somebody who feels like they're in a community at, that is just totally resistant to change? So I would, the first thing that I try to do with myself and I, I recommend to people that are trying to create change is first look at yourself first. How is your approach? How are you engaging people in conversation? What are you doing? Like, what are the things you can control? And that's how you present yourself, how you represent yourself, how you, the words you say. So first always start with yourself because a good idea, uh, no matter how good the idea is, if you bat people, you know, if you bash people over the head with it or engage them in a way that shuts them down right away with kind of negative conversation to start, it's, um, it's not going to go anywhere. So you always have to start with that. Then really, I think you'd have to look at what are you trying to succeed and look at the big picture. But then from that, take step back to take a few steps back and say like, okay, what is step one in this process to get there? I think what I find people get frustrated with is they see something that they feel needs to be changed within a program or a system. And they just want to get to the results right away. Like, you know, if we did X, we would save this many more animals rather than say like, okay, but to be able to get there, what, what are the programs, uh, what resources we do we need? How do we do it? So really try to tackle it, like divide it because I, I think the problems we deal with in animal welfare are just so overwhelming, so overwhelming that you could just shut down and say like, this isn't even worth trying. We're never going to defeat it. So you have to really, you have to kind of divide it into chewable bites and, and try to get those little successes with the long-term goal in mind. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. And I think when we have had situations, when I've talked to people individually about that feeling of resistance and frustration and that no one wants to help the animals or doing those types of things. I, when we really do sit down and talk about what their, what the approach is and what the goals are, I do find that, you know, one of the commonalities is that the approach may not be either able to be easily understood by who they're explaining it to and might need to be more simplified in the approach or that the approach is really strongly emotional or kind of coming at it from a more combative standpoint that isn't likely to get people to align with us. So I think sometimes in animal welfare, we tend to lose our cool pretty easily and we tend to project ourselves in a way that that might not make us look like sane and intelligent approach uh, people. And we might be coming across as more fanatical. And I think that our people aren't don't really align with that. So I think starting with a conversation about what the person's concern is about the animals and what we're trying to get to and see what common grounds we can find. I really do think that when we start talking to people in our community about the needs of animals and the and trying to find solutions, most people want to help animals. Most people don't want to um, do things that will harm animals. I think it's just a matter of adjusting our approach to get the success that we want 
and trying to hit, I think Carmen said, is the more achievable goals and trying to find commonalities rather than trying to get everything all at once. So in the statement about commonalities, I'm going to actually pull out a bit of a difference between the two of you, and we'll see see what the conversation... It may not be different, but we'll, we'll see. Uh, so Dakin does transport cats in from out of state. In general, MSPCA does not. I know that there are some special cases where the MSPCA has. So Carmen, you want to Tell us a little bit about what the transport program is for cats, and then maybe, Mike, tell us a little bit about what MSPCA's thoughts are. Sure. So, yeah, you know, cats are certainly a newer part of our transport program, um, and it's still a pretty small percentage of the animals we take in each year. But I think one of the challenges that, and I think this is uh, an area that people can differ on, but one of the things that I'm struggling with now is that we have so many people that really want to adopt. They want to adopt a, a dog or a cat from a humane society or from a rescue, and it's becoming harder and harder for them to find animals. So the difficult part, the, the part that I'm challenged with is what do we tell people? Like, where do we tell them to go? So our shelters don't have cats available for adoption. Where are we sending them? So we have the capacity. We have the room. There are areas we feel we can help. So let's... Let's try that. And we try to be pretty strategic and targeted and not just take animals from any location. We try to build a a responsible relationship. We just started a partnership with a shelter in Virginia that they have an amazing program. So their capacity is such that they have a vast network of foster homes. They have a kitten ICU. So they're able to help groups around them that aren't able to take underage kittens that need foster care and aren't ready to be adoption age. So what they found, though, is they were having difficulty at adoption age. They couldn't move the animals through spay, neuter, and adoption fast enough, so they were bottlenecking at adoption age, and it limited their ability to take in other cats from surrounding shelters that were having to make euthanasia decisions for those underage kittens. We certainly do not have a problem with adoption age. We, you know, just this past weekend, I think, had 25 kittens on the adoption floor and 25 kittens adopted. So it, it seemed like a really good and smart partnership to do that. And I, you know, I do think part of our role is helping people find animals. I do think that is a piece. I think it's a really good feeling. I do think it's going to become less of what we do, but since we have the capacity to do it and we have a facility that's able to welcome adopters and have them come in, we decided to do that. And to give you an idea of numbers in uh, 2017, so if you look at the calendar year, Local kittens, we took in 1,152 kittens just from our local community, and we transported in 154 kittens. So it's a still pretty small percentage of what's coming from us. And we would not, if we weren't able to absorb local kittens, uh, we would not be you know, even talking about taking them from other places. Yeah, and I think from the MSPCA standpoint, and I know that I can be at times, you know, far more aggressive about this statement, but I think I've adjusted that over the years. I think there's there's a couple of layers that I always like to point out to people. For the MSPCA, first and foremost, the starting point for us to be able to consider importation is the ability for us to comply with the uh, Massachusetts regulations for import. And out of our three locations, our Angel, including our Angel Animal Medical Center in Boston, but also our Boston Adoption Center, our Cape Cod Adoption Center, and our Methuen location, we only have four current spaces that have been approved by the state for for quarantine. So, and those are actually dog runs. So, uh, and one small tiny room that wasn't actually designed as an animal space. So, our capacity to be able to take in animals from importation is very low. So, we would actually do, you know, really we'd be talking about if we were to group cats, for instance, like we did when we took animals from Puerto Rico, we're probably talking about 20 animals at a time unless it's more of an emergent situation and we were to try to go a little bit a little bit larger uh, numbers in those group spaces. So it's not really likely that we're going to be able to do that regularly enough to have a big impact either on our adoption program or on the location that we're taking the animals from with a fairly heavy cost associated with it. For us to really consider doing importation on any achievable level, we would have to talk about a major investment in infrastructure of our buildings to be able to adjust to the quarantine regulations that are there. So when we talked about whether it's better to invest in that to try to do the approach to adoption or whether it's better for us to use those resources for other reasons, I think it came, you know, what became apparent to me is that many organizations are importing in Massachusetts and New England, but not necessarily a lot of organizations are doing community outreach and direct community outreach. 
So it felt like to me that Best Impact might be able to help the animals that are in our community that that need access to resources to be successful. So we've chosen that pathway. I would also say that one of the things that I would be motivated to get involved with when it comes to to importation was if that we if we had a little bit more strategy behind our importation programs. And we have talked about this at New England Fed meetings and with groups that we we have seen amazingly amazingly great success with targeted spay neuter. I think most people in animal welfare can recognize that that has been a major change in our approach that has had success. And I would love to see us consider doing that as a region for coordinated importation to try to help a specific region. So, for example, could Massachusetts align our resources for importation to be able to help another state, let's just say Georgia, for the sake of conversation, and we were to all align on helping Georgia get to a more stable point through importing animals for helping with overflow and for those organizations that can't help with importation, that perhaps we would be able to provide other resources like spay-neuter mentorship or things on those lines to try to help that community get to where we are in the pathway of animal welfare and the timeline of animal welfare. So I would really love to see us move from a situation where it looks like a Southwest Airlines map of just, you know, all these animals coming from every different state into our state I mean, kind of have this random approach to a little bit more targeted so that maybe we could have a greater effect. And if we started getting Georgia healthy, then maybe we help Mississippi or wherever the problems might be and that we can have a big effect as opposed to um, perhaps a smaller effect. I'm with you on that one, Mike. Great. Can I get one from Carmen, too? And we're all, and then we get three. Yeah, that's right. I'm with you on that, too. <laughs> we're proud to be an affiliate of Space Kitty Express, makers of handmade, refillable catnip alternative cat toys. Think Valerian, Silver Vine, Honeysuckle, etc. For the discerning cat who wants to try something new or doesn't respond to catnip. You can even get 10% off your purchase at Space Kitty Express by using the code Community Cats at checkout. Help your kitty blast off today with some new toys from www.spacekittyexpress.com. <coughs> Did you miss the 2018 online cat conference that we held in January? Or would you like to share some of the conference webinars with friends? You can now purchase the presentations and share them with colleagues and friends. Just visit our recordings page, which is under the resources tab, to access webinars from some of the leading personalities in feline welfare today. They're sure to give you and your cat-loving friends great ideas on ways to help even more cats. Check it out at www.communitycatspodcast.com. For my last question, before we have to have to close out here, I'm going to ask you both to just sort of looking forward with regards to community cats, and and can you could you identify sort of what you think might be your your greatest challenge going forward? Immediate or like the next like five years? Or the so? next three to five years. Like, what do you think life will be like for community cats three to five years down the down the road? Do you think you're not going to have any cats in the shelter? Or are we always going to be dealing with, you know, the old, strange, odd, and dysfunctional? I always refer to them, but I always say, too, <laughs> that people are old, strange, odd, and dysfunctional, too, so we all match up perfectly. But that's that's tending to be what we're getting in our shelters. And are we going to be continue to be faced with that challenge down down the road? And then for our community cats, I mean, what what do you see happening there sort of in, in Massachusetts, what's the momentum forward? Hopefully our Humane Alliance clinics or and the clinics that we have, are they going to be able to, to continue to sustain themselves? Are we going to see some shelters go out of business? Uh, you know, what do you see going forward for us in New England? Well, I do think that uh, it will always be a place for shelters or rescues. The reality is, is we're here to provide a service and, and, you know, sometimes the bond does break between a human and an animal and the, you know, most appropriate choice in that case is for them to have the animal come to a shelter to be rehomed. I do believe though, we are going to have fewer and fewer animals that quote unquote work in every home. You know, I think it's not going to be the place to get a friendly social, there'll be some of them, but the friendly social pet that um, can work in most homes, I, I do think we'll see 
because it, quite frankly, as we have fewer in the shelters, it's easier for people on their own to find placement for animals that are easier to place. So I do think we will be organizations that are faced with having uh, challenging animals and being able to have programs and services that are able to meet the needs of those most challenging animals in our care. For community cats, you know, I, I don't know. I think that's a, it's, for me, it's still a big X factor of how I would like to see, you know, region by region, again, have a more strategic approach. I think more groups are going to need to merge and be together and work together on these problems to solve them, because I do think there is still a level of just kind of a scattered approach where we take, you know, the, I haven't seen a, a really good full scale, certainly, uh, I don't even know that it's countywide, but statewide at all, that uh, everyone's kind of approaching it together, focusing on an area makes sustainable change. So I think until we are able to form some coalitions, work together as groups, we, we probably won't have this significant change in the community cat region within the next five years or so. I think I, because I do think it's, it, you know, when you have all these individuals working, it makes it incredibly hard to coordinate and, and you know, focus efforts. I think ultimately we are moving into a phase in which we are going from an overpopulation state to a point of having a stable population. So I would assume that for both community cats and for animal shelters, we are going to be faced with reinventing ourselves overall. So do we need to keep doing exactly the, the things that we've always been doing? I mean, I think the reality is when we look back in time, the time in which animal shelters for, you know, had, was there and necessary for some period of time. But I think we've always had the mantra that we are the one business that wants to put ourselves out of business. And I think as we all are approaching that reality, we are all a little scared because we're not sure what to do next. So I think it's important that I think what you're going to see over the next three to five years is that everybody is going to start to have that realization. I think I, it was far more prevalent this year at New England Federation if you made society's conference than it was any other year that we've talked about this subject. So I think it's on people's minds. And I think we're going to start to see a point in which we start to become more innovative and we start to become more introspective about what is our role within our communities and what is our roles with helping animals. And I think that that's going to mean that people are going to make significant or minor changes to adjust to what our reality is now. So like Carmen said, shelters may or may not necessarily need to exist in the same way that they did before. There will always be animals that need to be rehomed and always animals that were at risk. So in some capacity, we will always operate that way. But the adoptions may shift from inside an adoption center to inside our community. Um, and I think with community cats, I think one of the big shifts is going to probably end up being is that we have been so heavily focused on the animals only and not the people attached to them. So when we're talking about feral cat colonies, we're not necessarily we're not necessarily including the people in that process. So some groups are going to need to, I think, start to look at community cats differently and start thinking about how do we make communication and partnerships with people in that community to take over the care, to identify and help identify whether those animals are owned or not, and do it through the people as opposed to doing it through the animal need. And we may find that what we presume to be true in the past may have changed. And I think we only can do that the more we actually meet people in the community and address the needs through the eyes of the people that live there. So I think that's the essence of the Pets for Life program and other types of programs, but it can be invented in different ways depending on what the origin of our organization started for. So I think it's going to be a period of incredible change, and I think we should all be pretty excited that we're in a good place for animals, um, and now it's time for us to think about how do we preserve the human-animal bond like we've talked about, how do we help people pe uh, keep animals in places where they are loved and cared for, and how do we help that relationship be fostered, not severed? And so I think it's going to be a pretty exciting time for all of us. Yeah, that's excellent. That's that's really true. I mean, one of the parallels or conversation pieces that I've had with folks is talking about orphanages and that they don't exist anymore. So it's now a foster care system. And so, you know, that might be the dynamic of, of change a bit is that, as you say, the programs are more in the community and kept locally. So, you know, kids aren't bouncing from different schools to schools and, and that kind of thing. Well, and we're keeping our cats, you know, in our community too. And say there is a cat that needs to be rehomed. It's not rehomed from you know, Springfield to Boston, it's rehomed within Springfield, within the community, maybe not having involvement in the shelter, but yet the community is taking care of that cat. 
So it's it's a really nice picture, I think, um, think going forward. If folks are interested in finding out more about your organizations, Carmen, uh, what's your website and how would they check you out? It's DakinHumane.org, so D-A-K-I-N, Humane. I'm assuming everyone listening to this podcast knows how to spell humane.org. <laughs> <laughs> and they can find there. And actually on the website, you could get to my email as well, which is just uh, C Chenzo, C D I C E N S O. And that's at dakinhumane.org. And uh, Mike, what's, what's your uh, website? Ours is mspca.org, and I assume everyone knows how to spell MSPCA because it's just letters. <laughs> and people can certainly reach out to me directly at mkiley, which is K-E-I-L-E-Y, at mspca.org. Now, is the Carmen and Mike show scheduled to play anywhere going forward, or did you guys just finish your conference season? We just did. We don't have any uh, dates booked just yet, but we do expect to hear from our agent soon to see what is coming. <laughs> <laughs> yep, and we can be booked for a fee for any uh, any individual bookings that anybody wants as well. We're happy to do that. So. We will work for beer. So. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's what we meant by payment. <laughs> yep. So if there are folks organizing conferences, there are quite a few regional conferences out there. And I know you guys travel a lot, and I know it's tough and everything, but it's it's wonderful to hear. Uh, you know your thoughts on how things are changing going forward, and um, you know, and just sort of what's happened to us over the years. And, and I really do think that there's a lot of positive energy all across the country. Before we finally close out, anything else, uh, Carmen, would you like to share with our listeners? No, just I, you know, I just kind of mirror something that Mike said earlier is that it is, you know, it's an exciting and a scary time in animal welfare because we're really not sure of our future. And I, and I think we're going to help more and more animals as we start to reach into the community and really have a partnership. And, you know, if I were to, have the perfect future for animal welfare. I would blur the lines between animal welfare and human welfare and look at them together because people help animals and animals help people and we should help both together. Mike, any last thoughts? You get to close out the show. Oh man, so much pressure. Uh, well, no, I think, I think uh, one of the other things that Carmen and I talk a lot about is really just looking at ways in which we can all work with each other I think we have spent an enormous amount of wasted energy and time trying to separate within animal welfare welfare, and starting with labeling our organizations with terms like no-kill or even, so like I said earlier, open admission or managed admission. And I think we really need to start thinking about how do we deliver messages together and how do we really move to a, a place in which we are really aligning with each other and not trying to compete with each other. Because I think one of the things that's always been frustrating for me in animal welfare is that we have allowed ourselves to be weak because we separate ourselves. And if we can join together and find our commonalities between our organizations, we will be even stronger. And I think it's in time for us to pull together and really work towards how we might be able to help the largest number of people and animals. So I think it's an exciting time. And like and Carmen said, it is scary at the same time, but it's time for us to all work together. Well, Mike and Carmen, I want to thank you so much to both of you for agreeing to be a guest on my show. And we'll have to uh, do the, the Carmen and Mike show uh, again. Anytime okay, you thanks need for us. Having us. Thank you for listening to the Community Cats podcast. I would really appreciate it if you would go to iTunes, leave a review of the show. It will help spread the word to help more community cats. 